Welcome back to Morpheus, Johnny. I am so happy that you are here again today. You are such a wealth of information. You are 15 time author. I mean, best-selling author. You have been a nutritionist for so many years. So smart and one of my favorite people. So when I thought of doing this video today, we are going to basically bust some myths. I thought who other than Mr. Johnny Bowden to join me to do that. So welcome back. Oh, it's a joy to be here as always. And I'm looking forward to this uh, little thing you've got planned. We're going to start with video number one. Johnny, we're going to go with, is coconut oil good or bad for our health? Watch this. So I want to point out that first, coconut oil has the most saturated fat. So it has more saturated fat than butter and lard in most cases. And most of us and most cardiologists would agree that saturated fat is really not a friend of the cardiovascular system. Okay, let's stop right there. All right, so... <laughs> See, this is what these traditional doctors and cardiologists and spokespeople from the American Medical Association that go on Good Morning America and, and perpetrate this crap. This is what they do all the time. They have no new research. They have no clinical studies. They base their condemnation of something like coconut oil or palm oil on one fact only. And that fact is that it has saturated fat. Right. Yes. It does. So what, dude? There's been 10 years of research since 19, since 2010, study after study, starting with the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition in 2010, followed by the Annals of, of Internal Medicine in 2014, followed by Zoe Harcum's PhD thesis published in the British Medical Journal, all of which looked at the connection between saturated fat and heart disease and found zero. Saturated fat doesn't cause heart disease. So this stupid argument that, well, this coconut oil can't be good because it has saturated fat is based on medicine from 20 years ago. It's okay. just based on identifying this one element in coconut oil or palm oil or whatever it is that they condemn and saying that it has saturated fat, therefore it causes heart disease, except they forgot the part that saturated fat has been exonerated from causing heart disease. And that's all in the literature. You can look it up. It's all on PubMed. In fact, there was a terrific study that came out of Malaysia just last year, the end of last year, where they looked at patterns of eating. And they looked at high fat, low fat, high carb, low carb, moderate protein. They had It was a matrix of all things. And it was done in Malaysia where 80% of the fat is palm oil, which is a mostly a saturated fat. So everybody was eating the same saturated fat. You know what made the difference for heart disease? What? How much carbohydrates they ate. Mm -hmm. It didn't matter one drop how much fat they ate and it was all saturated fat. I'm sorry, saturated fat doesn't cause heart disease. You guys are reading medicine from 20 years ago and just and, and it never really did. It was just a hypothesis that has since been disproven and it's time to let go of it. And I love that you're saying that. And we did talk about that, that the Ansel Keys, right? That's what you're referring to. In that's where of, it started. That's where it started. So we did talk about that in our other videos that we're going to link to below. It will put the links below. And also we have a card up top. So you and can I wanna, Let me give an addendum to that coconut story. Um, one of the first uh, studies that I read when I started studying nutrition with Robert Crayon in the 90s was the study of the Trobian Islanders. And it was done in the 70s. It is published, it is online, anybody can find it. It's the Poku Poku of the Trobian Islanders. They eat a diet in which 80% of their, 80% of their calories came from coconut, coconut fat, coconut meat, coconut products, 80% of calories. You know what the heart disease rate was in that, in that Trobian Islander? Very low. They couldn't measure it. Yeah. It was immeasurably low. Wow. So uh, th this nonsense about coconut oil causing heart disease, all they can say against coconut oil is that it has saturated fat. That's it. I'd like to see one study that showed anywhere that eating coconut oil in any way increased the risk for actual events. Yeah, so you see dad and anyone else like my dad who calls me up every time there's a new study that comes out or some news that Those comes out. Those are not says, studies, Andrea. It's really important. The American yeah. Medical Association sent people on Good Morning America not too long ago, and they were talking about this very issue. And they were, yeah. again, doubling down on the notion of saturated fat and doubling down on the notion of cholesterol. They had not one new study 
again, they were basing all of this all coconut studies. oil demonization on the fact that it has saturated fat yeah. and that everybody knows that saturated fat causes heart disease, except everybody doesn't know that, especially the people who've been reading the literature for the last 10 years. Yeah, I love that. So myth number one, busted. Is coconut oil good or bad for you, Johnny? It is? In, here's, let, me, let me clarify this. If it were bad for you, it would not be because it has saturated fat. It would have to be some other thing that has not been discovered yet. But okay. the, it is certainly not bad for you because it has saturated fat. All right. I'm going to give it a green check mark. Coconut yes. oil is good. Love for coconut you. oil. All right. Let's move on to canola oil. Play the next clip, Johnny. You're picking all my favorite foods, right? Okay. Let's see what we got. Okay. Video two. The healthiest cooking oil. Canola oil, oh really? Okay. Ah, stop it right there. Okay, so <laughs> let's stop. So, it's, so if, for those who can't see, it's, it's a commercial for canola oil, the healthiest oil in the world. And the first thing that it says to show how healthy it is, is that it has the least saturated fat. So once again, before we even go any further about this crappy canola oil, which I've, I've never been a fan of, before we even go any further, let's look at, again, the argument, which is exactly the, 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 the same argument used to condemn coconut oil. Canola oil is good because it doesn't have saturated fat. Again, this entire thing rests on the outdated premise that saturated fat causes heart disease. Yeah. See, if it doesn't, all of these guidelines collapse like a house of cards. Amazing. You've been told not to eat saturated fat because it causes heart disease, but it doesn't. But it doesn't. So if that is not so, and it isn't, then all of this other stuff, coconut oil is bad because it has saturated fat. Canola oil is good because it doesn't have saturated fat. It's all based on a false premise. So we don't even have to go any further. Now I'll tell you all the rest of the stuff that makes canola oil not, in my opinion, the, certainly not one of the more healthy oils. Yeah. Number one, 90 something percent of it is GMO. I'm not a fan of GMO to begin with. Number two, it is one of the most processed oils to make, first of all, it comes from a plant called the rapeseed plant. They couldn't sell rapeseed oil because of the name. So they, they changed it because it comes from Canada, can, Ola, Ola means oil, so Canadian oil. And it was literally, how are we gonna sell this stuff? We've got, you know, the rapeseed plant, it does what it does. We got all this runoff, it's inedible, it smells horrible. Can we somehow make this into something that we can sell? It has to be degummed, it has to be deodorized. It has to be- How many chemicals are used? Yeah. Such high heat and with such crappy chemicals that it's just hard to see how that remains a good healthy oil. It seems to me the only thing that recommends it is that it doesn't have saturated fat. And as I said, who cares? Now, caveat, there are naturopathic physicians who I respect a great deal like Alan Christensen, who do not agree with my assessment of canola oil. And they point out that there are small companies that do make organic, which means it's not GMO, cold pressed canola oil, and that that can be a good oil. I will concede that under those circumstances, it might be an acceptable oil, but that's not most of the canola oil that's sold in America. It's certainly not the kind that yeah. you see when you see it as an ingredient and everybody thinks it's so healthy because, oh, it uses canola oil. That's the junkiest kind of canola oil there is. And while Alan may be right, that you, it's possible to make a decent canola oil. I do not see how this becomes one of the healthiest oils on the planet when you've got things like olive oil and almond oil and, and coconut oil and palm oil and, and ghee and, and grass-fed butter. A canola oil to me, is just it's a, it's a, I never use it. Let's move on to video number three. Now we're gonna talk about monounsaturated and polyunsaturated fats. Hit play, Johnny. Can't wait. All right. Here we go. Oils are composed of good fats, heart healthy, or artery clogging bad fats. Artery good fats clogging include bad monounsaturated fat. and polyunsaturated fat, both of which lower total cholesterol and lower LDL or bad cholesterol. Bad fats include saturated and trans fat, both of which raise LDL cholesterol. We'll show you a list of cooking oils that contain the best ratio of the better for you fats. And Do I have to listen to the rest? Oil for the job. <laughs> Watch canola the whole oil thing. is made from seeds of the canola plant 
It is low and saturated. Canola fat. plant. It has a neutral flavor with a smoke point of 400 degrees Fahrenheit. It is commonly used in sauteing, baking, frying, and marinating. All right, you can stop it there. It's good for all purpose cooking. Yeah, and you cooking. know, here's the thing. Oils made from shell. The, the thing about these pieces, which are really based on 1950s medicine and 1950s or 60s is understanding of nutrition. Um, the thing about them is that they contain some truths, but they mix them in with so many misconceptions that the whole mess is just, we have to deconstruct it. So monounsaturated, the first thing it says in this clip is that monounsaturated and polyunsaturated fats are healthy, saturated fats are not. I think if you play the past two clips that we looked at, you, you've you heard me point. talk about this. It's just not true. Now, here's where it gets mixed up. They say polyunsaturated fats and monounsaturated fats are always good. Well, monounsaturated fats are good. They are highly anti-inflammatory. They have uh, things like olive oil is a, is a great example of monounsaturated fats. I was going to get some fats. examples. It has yeah. all kinds of polyphenols. It has all kinds. They, they're just, they are really, I, I just finished writing an article about this. They're, they're like medicine. Uh, I mean, olive oil is as good as it gets. So that is a monounsaturated fat. So that is correct. Polyunsaturated fats is a big circle. <laughs> it's, a, it's a big category. And it includes both omega-3 fats, which are maybe one of the healthiest and most anti-inflammatory fats on the planet, and omega-6 fats, which are kind of pro-inflammatory and mostly crappy. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so, so putting them together in one category and saying polyunsaturated fats are, are good, well, that includes you know corn oil and safflower oil, sunflower oil, all the oils I tell people not to eat. Yeah. So it, it's again, it's a very vague statement and, and it's based again on this antiquated notion that anything that isn't saturated fat is good and anything that is saturated fat is bad. And that it's, it's such, it's been such a harmful concept in, in, in American nutrition. It is, it, it is paralleled with the diabetes epidemic, the obesity epidemic, the heart disease increase, because fat is not what causes these diseases. What really, really promotes these diseases is sugar and starch. Yeah, hundred percent. And we talked about that in our, in our whole video about insulin resistance and blood sugar balance, which again, we're going to link to below because Johnny, that was one of my favorite interviews. I mean, it was yeah. spot on and it's so important. And we're going to keep repeating that because that is really the culprit sugar yeah. carbohydrates. So yeah. we're going to, we're going to link to that below so you can watch that. Okay. We're going to move on to the next video, Johnny. This is about corn oil, healthy or not hit play. Did you know that heart healthy Mazzola corn oil contains 30% more naturally occurring plant sterols than canola oil? Three times as many plant sterols as vegetable or soybean. I'm never coming on your show again if you make me be tortured by watching this crap. But just what are plant sterols? Oh. Well, plant <laughs> sterols, or phytosterols, are plant based micronutrients. And most importantly, they're good for you. Studies show that when consumed as part of a diet low in saturated fat and cholesterol, Plant sterols can help reduce a stomach's cholesterol intake, which can lower LDL blood cholesterol. That's the bad stuff. <sighs> but you might be wondering where plant sterols are found. All right, you well, can stop it. Plant sterols can Thank be found God. in fruits. <laughs> All, All right, right so thoughts. Again, the, you know, the, the, everything that we're just listening to now is again based on uh, the notion that anything that lowers cholesterol is good and anything that raises it is bad. And cholesterol is one big thing that we want to stay away from and make sure that it's as low as can be. So the whole uh, rap about the plant sterols is based on that. Again, corn, one of the most GMO products in the world, uh, over 90%. Um, but even if that weren't the issue, and, and for me, it is a issue, uh, it is the high, it's a high omega-6 processed oil. Omega-6s yeah. are important. We need to get them in our system. We need to have them in a balance of one to one with the omega-3s. We currently consume about 16 to 20 to one in favor of these pro-inflammatory omega-6s. Yeah. And corn oil is loaded with them. Corn oil, safflower oil, sunflower oil, they're all polyunsaturated and they all contribute to inflammation. They're all processed so that they have nothing of any nutritive value left in them whatsoever. And they upset the balance between the anti-inflammatory threes and the, the 
pro-inflammatory sixes that we're eating a ton of. Yeah. So I see no reason other than a lot of marketing and a lot of, you know, people having memes in their head about corn fed Americans. And, you know, we're all the good old Midwest with the wheat fields. I mean, those images make you think corn fed is healthy. Corn fed is not particularly healthy. Corn fed is how you make cattle fat. And it's also how you make people fat. And it's certainly not how we make them healthy. So I'm going to pass on corn oil. All right, corn oil, big X. The next video, Mr. Johnny Bowden, I'm very excited about because there is still confusion for some people around butter versus margarine. And I hear it all the time. Is butter better or is margarine better when it comes to being heart healthy? Play the next video, Johnny, because I wanna know, are we busting this myth? Which one is healthier for us? What's better for you, a pat of butter or a spread of margarine? When we think about butter and margarine from a health perspective, maybe particularly like a cardiovascular heart perspective, margarine seems to have a bit of an advantage. It comes down to good fats versus bad fats. Margarine's likely going to have more unsaturated fat where butter is going to have saturated fat. Saturated fat is known to raise bad cholesterol, I mean, LDL cholesterol. <laughs> Once again, we are judging by a mythology that is long past its expiration date. Every one of these arguments against coconut oil, for canola oil, against butter, for margarine, is based on one fact only, whether or not it has saturated fat. Yeah. This is... I, I, it's no way to overstate the damage this has done to our health. This avoidance of fat led to this overconsumption of low fat foods, high sugar foods, high processed foods, high fructose corn syrup added to everything yeah. from hamburger buns to whatever else you can find everything. in the grocery store. <laughs> Pretty much. And that has made us fat, sick, tired, and depressed. Mm -hmm. And all those guidelines and all of this crap about polyunsaturated fats are always good. And this is good. Why? Because it doesn't have saturated fat. It's all based on the mythology that saturated fat causes heart disease. And we know that to not be true. We know that because we've had a good dozen years of research confirming it. And it's all published and it's all online. And these people continue to ignore it. They're either tone deaf to it, or they have something invested in keeping it the way it is, or they just don't want to look at anything. They are literally doing see no evil, hear no evil. I'm just going to repeat the saturated fat crap until I die. And that's what it looks like and that's what it sounds like. And if we continue to use that mythology to evaluate foods, we are going to get sicker, fatter, more tired, more depressed, more lethargic. And instead of eating the foods that actually support us in having energy and lean bodies and, and vitality, yep. which include fats and include saturated fats, but do not include the shit that they substituted for saturated fat, like sugar and starch, we will continue to have our health deteriorate because it's based on this outdated antiquated notion that saturated in fat and, and cholesterol cause heart disease. Yeah. That causes us to take our eyes off the ball of what's really promoting chronic disease and that is sugar, starch and their result, insulin resistance. And also bad fats. A lot of margarines, and at least now they're cleaning it up a little bit, but a lot of them contained hydrogenated oils, partially hydrogenated oils. So that's something that we need to keep in mind too when buying margarine. So if you see that heart healthy logo, just turn the turn it over and look at the ingredients because that will be telling as well as to what's in it. If it has something called datum in it or mono and diglycerides, those are all forms of trans fat. So we need to become really good at reading labels and understanding them. The next oil that I want to move on to, Johnny, is soy oil because I was I was reading an article. Now there's no, no video for this one, but I just wanted to get your reaction to some of the things that I'm going to read. So I'm going to start off by the person who wrote this article said that this post was sponsored by the United Soybean Board through Kitchen Play. So it was sponsored by the Soybean Board. So this was a dietitian, and she was talking about people asking her about is soybean oil healthy? And she goes on to say that she does believe that it's healthy. It's widely used in the US and it is healthy for several different reasons, including that the FDA authorized a qualified heart health claim for oils in high in oleic acid, including high oleic soybean oil, confirming the relationship to a reduced risk of coronary heart disease when replacing oils higher in saturated fats. Again, 
you know, it's it's an interesting theme, and you and you're you're calling it. It's the theme throughout is all about the saturated fats and how that pertains to heart health. So again, another oil that someone is claiming, a dietitian in this case, is claiming that soybean oil oil is healthy. Check mark or big X is soybean oil healthy? Um, it's never been one of my favorite oils. It's always been one of the ones that I use as an example of what not to do. Um, again, over ninety percent GMO if that matters to you. But even if it doesn't, right. it's highly inflammatory, pro-inflammatory. It's mostly omega-6. Again, it has really nothing <laughs> to, to recommend it other than the mythology that because it doesn't have saturated fat, it's good. It's yeah. really not. It's a pro-inflammatory oil made of GMO crop uh, that, uh, and, and as far as I know, and don't quote me on this, we'd have to check, but the health claim, that was once permitted for soy has been removed. Uh, I, that I'm was not... in 2018. So yeah, okay. So the, so so even that, and in uh, I believe in Israel they don't even allow it in formula anymore because of the phytoestrogen. So I am just not a fan of soy oil in any way. I never use it. Hmm. Very interesting. And you, you mentioned the word pro-inflammatory. I think for our viewers, it would be important to explain what that means. We know that pro-inflammatory means it creates inflammation in the body, but give us a little bit about how, what, the, what are those effects when that inflammation is created from all these seed oils or these oils that are not good for us that are high in omega-6? Well, a very, very quick course in inflammation. Um, inflammation is a necessary part of the healing process in our bodies. We need to be able to cause some inflammation, a temperature, uh, the swelling around a wound is the white blood cells and they're causing an inflammatory response. And all of that is part of the response that's meant to protect us from microbes and protect us from invading uh, substances that could cause uh, uh, damage. Um, so we need inflammatory pathways in the body. The problem is that the inflammatory pathways, well, let's think of them as an army. We have this inflammatory army. It has to be balanced with the anti-inflammatory army yeah. because there are so many things out there out of our control that cause inflammation like toxins and pesticides and glyphosate and, and all the stuff that's in the food and in the air and the water supply and our stress, all of this causes inflammation. So our anti, if you think of it as two armies, anti-inflammatory and pro-inflammatory, they both have certain metabolic pathways. They have to be funded by the government, which is us, the food that we eat, and they need to be funded equally. Because if one is out of balance, with, and it's never the anti-inflammatory forces that are out of balance and, and, and running too high, it's always the pro-inflammatory ones. Yeah. Because there is so many pro-inflammatory oils like the ones we've been talking about in the diet. So our ratio of intake between the inflammatory and the pro-inflammatory, and anti-inflammatory and pro-inflammatory fats is 16 to 1. Yeah. And in some parts of the country, it's 20 to one or 25. To and it one. needs to be one to one. It should be one to one, maybe two to one, not 20 to one. And where are all these inflammatory fats coming from? Unfortunately, mostly from the vegetable oils we put into every damn food that we make. Yeah. And you have to read the ingredients. Like I was eating seaweed and I thought this seaweed was really healthy. And then I looked at the ingredients and it had sunflower oil. And I was like, whoa. And I, you know, and, and the reason why I'm saying that is because I actually felt inflammation in my body. My body was aching for a long time and I'm a pretty clean eater. And I couldn't figure out for the longest time what it was that was causing the inflammation. It was the seed oils and they were, they are very pro-inflammatory. So listen very to your powerful. bodies. If you find that you're ache, you have aches and pains, it could be just as a simple tip. Now there's other things obviously involved too, but as simple as removing these seed oils that are creating that inflammation in your body. So I think that's a great point, Johnny. Thank you for sharing that because I think it's something that's easy to do in many cases, but not many people are aware of. The next oil that I want to talk about, Johnny, is palm oil. There's a lot of misconception about palm oil, obviously, when it comes to its health benefits, but also when it comes to the environment. So can you share your thoughts on palm oil? Well, I think it, uh, in, in terms of the environment, it appears to matter where it comes from. Um, I care a lot about animals and environment, and I happen to love orangutans, which seem to be affected the most. Mm. And... <clears throat> My understanding of it, and I've looked into it because I, I do use palm oil and I often talk about Malaysian palm oil. And to the best of my understanding, and I think it's been pretty well documented, 
Uh, Malaysia particularly protects their forests far more than they do in the United States. The palm oil there is sustainably farmed. One tree feeds like a village. Um, and it, it really doesn't uh, have a, a negative impact on the environment, at least in that country. I can't speak for Indonesia and some of the other, and, and some of the South American countries where there may, I, I'm sure there are, are bad things done in the name of, of farming that particular plant, just like I'm sure there are things that we would like to not see done to the environment, plant, planting all kinds of other um, crops. But palm oil gets a lot of attention for that because it has been known to be farmed in certain and it, it countries in a way that, de that leads to deforestation. And we don't want that. So I can really only speak to Malaysian palm oil. And I do not believe that the environmental argument holds water with them. In fact, they're, they've been instrumental in getting countries certified, sustain, it's certified to be sustainable. Um, so I, I will, I, since environmentalism isn't my forte, I just feel pretty confident that, that that argument about the environmental impact of palm oil does not really apply to Malaysia. Um, and hopefully it will not apply to other countries as well. But right now I think it's fairly safe to say Malaysia's kind of exempt from that. Now, as far as the nutritional value of it, I think it's a terrific oil. I think the red ones, the less, the less, um, the less processed ones, the red palm oils are red because they have carotenoids in them. The, the same family of nutrients that beta carotene comes from. That's so that gives it a, yeah, that beautiful. They're loaded carotene. with them. They're also loaded with tocotrienols, which is a, a form, a fraction of vitamin E that's very protective to the brain. And they st it stands up to heat pretty well. Um, yeah, you can make stir fries and you can cook your eggs with it, which I like. It has a high smoke point, which it is great. It, it does. And of course, this, like any oil on the planet, including olive oil, we should say, the, the more refined it is, you lose nutrients but you gain smoke point because the yeah. more they refine it, the more you can heat it up. Yeah. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean it's better nutritionally. I, I like the, the less refined palm oils that have all that rich color because they retain a lot of the nutrients. So their smoke point is gonna be quite as high as the uh, refined ones, but it's gonna be very rich in nutrients. Um, I, I can mention that study that we talked about, I think, in one of the other interviews that came out of Malaysia, where they looked at patterns of eating and they looked at high carb, low carb, uh, high fat, low fat, and every kind of uh, a combination of that in a, in a matrix. And then they looked at people who ate those patterns and they compared it to risks, real risks and real events in heart disease. And they, they weren't just using the old fashioned cholesterol measures, they were using really good metrics for heart disease risk, ones mm -hmm. that we talk about in our book that we think are very valid. And what they found was it didn't really matter how much fat they ate and it was all palm oil. It, what mattered is how much carbohydrates they ate. Right. And when the carbohydrate proportion of the diet went up, the risk factors for heart disease went up. The amount of fat didn't seem to make much difference. And again, once again, it was all palm oil. So I, I'm not, I, I don't really subscribe to the notion that, that tropical oils like coconut and palm oil are bad for us at all. I, I think with palm oil, the worst you could say about it is neutral. And the best you could say about it is that it has some positive health benefits. I don't think you can say it's detrimental. There's no evidence for it. Hmm. So palm oil gets the green check mark. It does for me. The last thing I want to talk about, Johnny, is something very close and dear to our audience and myself is the chances of, once we're in menopause, what are the chances of having heart disease or getting heart disease? And I was reading something, it was a statistic that said that a woman's risk or chance of having a heart attack before she's in menopause is much lower than a man's risk at the same age. But the risk increases significantly 10 years after she's in menopause due to a decrease in estrogen. Now on this website and the research that I was doing, they were recommending, and it was a few websites, it wasn't just one, that they were recommending a low fat, high fiber diet, basically cutting back on or eliminating any type of red meat and any type of saturated fat. So basically taking it out of their diet completely in order to help prevent heart disease. And I thought what way would a great way to end today's interview would be to have your comments on it since we already know what your comments are, but just to hear your thoughts about it, particularly in particular related to women in menopause. From the vantage point of both nutrition and those recommendations for diet, um, I think I can make some comments of it with the caveat that I'm not an expert on 
menopause. The first thing I would ask is when they say that they think that the protective effect is estrogen, I would at least ask the question, why not any of the other hormones that diminish as we get older? I mean, there's a greater risk for men uh, with as we get older and we diminish our testosterone. I, so I don't know that it's all estrogen. It might be the whole hormonal milieu that changes so, so much after menopause and for men after the age of what we call andropause, it's kind of the same idea. The hormones Male menopause, diminish. Yeah. So it, maybe it's estrogen and estrogen has a lot of protective effects, but, it, and, and that's again, beyond my, my area of expertise to figure out how to increase or, or keep it up. But if estrogen is in fact the protective factor, I see no mechanism, no plausible mechanism by which a low fat diet would protect that estrogen. I see no possible explanation for what would be good about a low fat diet in menopause. In fact, I see a good argument, a good connect the dot arguments why that would be a very bad idea. Now, the high fiber part again, and this is where they mix a lot of things and some of it is true and some of it isn't. High fiber diet, I'm a big fan of for many reasons. And I think it helps with <clears throat> detoxification, it helps with digestion, it helps with assimilation, it helps with mod modulating your blood sugar. So the entrance of the food into the bloodstream isn't so quick because fiber slows yeah. it down in a healthy way, in a good way. So I'm all for high fiber diets and high fiber diets usually include a lot of nuts and berries and fruits and vegetables, all of which are good. My, my questioning of that advice is where does the having to cut red meat come from? Right. Where does the anti-saturated fat come from? Why can't you have a high fiber diet with lots of fruits and vegetables and nuts and berries and all the rest of it and still eat meat? Grass-fed meat without antibiotics, without steroids, without hormones, without all the bad stuff, but healthy grass-fed meat is definitely can be included in that kind of a diet. And I don't know why you'd wanna go low fat when so many uh, uh, things that are related to mood and sense of well being and appearance are all related <laughs> in some way to the amount of fat that you take in. And when low fat diets take over, man, you're high, back up to high sugar, high starch uh, and, and not feeling really good because our bodies need fat. We need fat. And for those who are watching here on YouTube or possibly listening on our podcast, you might be wondering, what about quantity? So, okay, Johnny, we understand saturated fat Good. isn't the demon that it once was. What is the quantity? So should we be eating, is it a percentage of fat that we should have in our diet, the saturated fat? So just to give a little bit more clarity around that. Well, you, it kind of depends on who you ask. I do not and have never believed in percentages. I, we could talk about that for 15 minutes. I just, they, don't, they don't hold up. They're not useful. Yep. Uh, they're not sustainable. Nobody does them. Nobody figures them out properly. And so there's sort of a, a, a just a general kind of aspirational thing. I, I eat 40, 30, 30. Oh, really? I'd love to see the calculator that confirms that. So I don't believe in percentages. Number The second reason I don't believe in percentages is because of what you just brought up what's the absolute amount yeah. so you could be eating a five percent carbohydrate diet but if you're eating ten thousand calories it's an awful lot of sugar so again it kind of depends and people say i you know i'm ten percent protein well that sounds good unless you're eating a thousand calories in which case you are not eating enough protein yeah. so we got to look at the absolute amounts not just the percentages i think that's silly um Love that. I, the other reason, more philosophical, is that I think that once you cross the bar of I am eating non-toxic food, I'm eating real food, I'm eating fats that have not been made toxic by either uh, over-processing or overheating or frying beneath uh, over their, their smoke point or doing any of the other yeah. things that we do in restaurants and at homes with fats to make them even worse than they are. I think when you're Try not that. eating those, when you're eating non-toxic, healthy fats, healthy proteins, clean proteins, and lots of the other stuff, yeah. I think amounts matter less. Once you cross that bar and you get it all into the real food zone, you can play with the amounts, you can play with the proportions, you can more fat, less fat, more protein, less protein, and find what actually works for you energetically and what makes you feel good and what keeps your weight where you want it to be. That you can play with, but you gotta cross the real food barrier first. There's no point in talking about percentages if you're talking about eating crap. Yeah, and I love that too, because it's so easy when you're talking about eating, you're, if you're eating good quality protein, you're eating a good meal where you have your vegetable, your salad, you have your meat, it's very hard to overeat 
saturated fats, right? That you're not going to sit there and you're not going to binge on overeating that kind of stuff. Whereas when it comes to eating foods with chemical additives, like our high fructose corn syrup or our food coloring and all of that, it, you can overeat big time. And then Easy. you're messing with your blood sugar and it's insulin resistant. So it's a whole other different thing too. So I think the important thing to take away here is I know you believe in eating a diet that you can pluck, that you can hunt, that you can fish or gather. I know we've talked about that before. So I know the important thing is eat what our bodies are meant to eat, eat what our bodies, how they can process it properly. Cause we can process real food properly and avoid the chemical additives. And then you're going to be in a good place. So Johnny, thank you so much. Beautifully yeah. said 100% agree. Thank Thanks. you so much for your time today. you always, I mean, I just love having you on the show. Thank you for dispelling some myths. It's uh, was very eye opening. And how can people just give a quick plug for your book, please. And also let people know how they could find you. The book is the new and revised and expanded edition of The Great Cholesterol Myth. I hope everybody reads it because I really believe the message is so vitally important to us, especially now in the time of COVID. We have got to get insulin resistance under control. It's what causes heart disease. It's, it, according to Jason Fung, it's one of the main causes of cancer. According to Dr. Brickman, it's one of the main causes of chronic disease globally. We got to get it under control and we can yeah. do it with diet. We can turn it around. We can, we can reverse it. We can prevent it all with diet and it has to not be this low fat, low saturated fat uh, stuff that we've been taught for the last 40 years. It needs to be a real food diet with plenty of good, healthy fat. I love it. Thank you for a terrific ending. And also people can find you at Johnny Bowden on social media. We have everything under your name here as well. Johnny, as always, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.